Good day. Welcome to episode 5 of Moving Forward. Moving Forward is the show where we examine the Trinidad and Tobago music industry and we try to propose a good way forward. Right? But before we do that, we have to go and examine the past to see where, what failures we had and what victories we had. Right? And I am Robin Foster and I present this program along with Mario Russell. Mario Russell is DJ Dongtong Outlaws or simply DJ Mario. Right, and um, we are today we have a special guest. The special guest is Mr. Michael Zoom Saloom, which you may also know him as Soka Elvis. Right, he is a recording artist and, and performing artist and also a businessman. All right, so we are gonna talk to him and yeah, Mario. Um, you know how it goes. You always open the bowling in this show. So go ahead. Okay, Michael. Um, yeah, good night, could, fellas. Could, good night, good night. Could you give us a history, like when you started as a little fellow, how long you in the business, um, and we work our way up. You know, it's always good to know more about the artists and you know, tell us about how you started. You know. Okay. Well, I am. Um, I born. I was born and I grew up in um in Woodbrook, Trinidad, and. Cornelio Street, to be exact, right? Opposite um, in the back of Woodbrook Secondary. Um, so I grew up around the, the culture, um, you know, with with um, the pan the pan sides in those days was like Invaders, Starleaf, Phase Two, um, Woodbrook Modernaires. That's the kind of steel pan sides that I grew mm-hmm. up around. And then they had like Wayne Barkley, Edmund Hart, Peter Minchell. So I grew up around the culture, but I didn't discover my musical talent until I was about nine or ten years old. Um, my mother was a classical piano player, and my big brother was a, a classic, a, a, a guitar player, quattro player, and a piano player. That is Anthony, mm-hmm. Master mm-hmm. Tone. Master Tone. So um, mm-hmm. yeah, so I grew up. Um, I grew up. You know, here and my mother play classical piano. You know, she comes from the style of like in the 1940s, the kind of swing and jazz era. And um, she played a mean piano boy, a classical mm-hmm. piano, this this big kind of old time pianos that was given to her by my grandmother. And um, so when I was about nine years old, we formed a family band and we started playing at like charity events and all that. Well, when I say started playing, I, I wasn't, Really part of the band. Yes, hold a second. My partner, the drummer, Roger Saloom. Roger, what, that w- is the man, Roger Saloom. What Roger what, dr- what 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 Roger is to you? Roger is my cousin. Is Roger, your cousin. All Roger right. actually grew up in Alice Glen, Trinidad, and he moved to Canada when okay. he was our brother. Yeah, I, I thought I thought he was your brother too, yes. No, uh, yeah, he's no. like our he's like our brother. It's, it's it's four of us. Um it's four boys and Roger's like our fifth brother, but he really left Trinidad when he was when he was young he went away to school and lived in Canada and he's back you know a lot of people think he's, he's, he's our brother but he's like a brother to us you know all right and um so we started this little musical band and they were looking for a singer nobody could sing any family Roger was playing drums um Anthony was on the, on the piano we couldn't find a bass player and we had a guy on guitar it was Roger's neighbor a guy called Mark Loquan yeah, I don't no know Mark. If you know Mark yeah, Mark. I know him well. Know him very well. Composer. I just did some right. work with him this year, in fact. A, a pan, right. He's a pan. He's a yes, pan guy. Pan. Okay. Right. Mm-hmm. So Mark was a guitarist, and they asked me to audition as a singer. And in them days, I used to dig people like um, Eddie Grant had some big songs called um, Neighbor Neighbor, mm-hmm. and Sparrow had a big song back in those days called um, How You Jamming So, and. Uh, they had a, a couple other pop songs from like the Doobie Brothers and thing called Listen to the Music. And Lord Nelson had a big song that year too. Um, la La. Mm-hmm, la La mm-hmm. Le, La 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 La. So that's the four songs I auditioned with. And I made the grade. I became the lead singer. Hmm. Um, the, the name of the band was The Who Rays. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and we played at like the Lions, the Lions Club. We played for like the Rotary Club. We played at the Normandy Hotel, the Hilton Hotel. A lot of we did a lot of um, charitable shows, and that was my. I was, you could say, I was a, a self-made musician. I, I never had any training. 
I just had it naturally that I auditioned in this little family band and I was able to sing in the correct melody, the, the correct key and the correct lyrics. You know, some people is either you have it or you don't have it. Eh? And I think I think I had it at that time and I discovered the talent from there. Mm -hmm. But I quit. But I did quit and went off to school away and um and didn't didn't um re I rediscovered my talent when I finished my school in my American um, high school and college years away and I came back home and and met up with some 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 new guys, some new talent, no no longer family member. The family family band break up by that time and um I met Joey Ningwai, um who is now the leader of Image and Company and we became really good friends. In my late teens, that was like 18, 19 years old when I came back from away. Roger was already living in Canada. Mark Loquan moved on. My brother Anthony was, my father passed away and Anthony was running the business. So mm -hmm. I hooked up with Joey Ningwai and um, that is it. Yeah, that I think that is when I first met you. Um, when you was playing with Joey and um, I think my brother-in-law used to play with all you, man. Um, um, oh, uh, Lemo. Lemo, right, right. Lemo. Yeah, well, right. Yeah, yeah. well, the yeah. amount of bands I used to be with, them, Mario <laughs> and Robin. Yeah. Yeah. If I start to name bands and, and musicians, I worked with a lot of musicians from Belmont. Wayne Lemacy, Dean James, right. Andy Disco. Schaaf, right. yeah. Disco. Mm -hmm. Disco. All those guys are away now and yeah, doing pretty boy. well. And, and Andy, Andy, Andy passed away. And he passed away in Japan, mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. so what year yeah. was, was that when you um, start Ooh. left school and started? Right, when I rediscovered my talent. I mm -hmm. would say when I left um, American College, I did a two-year business course there, and that was like 1983, 84. Mm -hmm. I came mm -hmm. back, and my love for the, the local music kind of faded away because I was going to school in Florida. Mm -hmm. I got influenced by the American-style um, country country and southern rock and i started going to concerts like um to see you know bands like journey and ario speedwagon and and 38 special and rock, a wide range a wide range of, of american and canadian and english style rock i was introduced to like led zeppelin and all these type of um medium to hard rock and southern rock bands and i started digging that type of music and Joey and I formed a band called Zumani Band, and we would play cover songs from from that era, from the early 80s, like, as I said, like Van Halen, Led Zeppelin, Brian Adams, and that, mm -hmm. that type of thing. And we were, we thought, we thought we were big rock stars, not knowing, you know, they had other bands of that era. They had bands like um, uh, Frantic was already performing, which right. we ended up merging and becoming a part of. There was a band called Touchdown as well, some boys from mm -hmm. some white boys from the south mm -hmm. that used to play mm -hmm. hard rock music as well too, which mm -hmm. we were very friendly with them. And then Taxi was now coming out into that era right. with um Colleen Ella and, and Derek Patience. And so I was around that era of um of pop and rock music, but I wasn't really into the culture music at that time. I, I, I kinda wanted to be a rock star, kinda a rock boy now. You know, and yeah. but you find uh, you you find a way later to fuse the two. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that yeah, lasted yeah. that lasted about six years exactly. Um Mario and Robin. That lasted mm -hmm. in from nineteen eighty four to about eighty nine, going into the end of nineteen eighty nine. I was with about I had my own band, Zumani band, then I was with Frantic, and then I left Frantic and I formed a band with your brother in law called Zoom and the Mercenaries with mm -hmm, Stephen mm -hmm. Ensenas, right. Disco James on the drums, Wayne Lemacy on the guitar, and um, a guy living in, I can't remember his name now, I think we, we used to call him, um, or Herbert Phelps on rock on the guitar. And we, we, we didn't last very long. I mean, I was, I was searching. I was jumping from band to band, but I think the most successful bands in that era that I was part of would have been Frantic and Zoom and the Mercenaries. Okay. And I catch up apps in 1990. Andy Schaaf was introduced to me by your brother-in-law, by Wayne. Mm -hmm. And Andy Schaaf was from Norfolk Street in Belmont. And I had a meeting with him and he said, you know, Zoom, I've been watching you. You're singing all these rock songs and things. But 
you need to come up with an idea and jump into the culture. You know what I mean? Are you interested? And around that time, um, Lebanon, there was a little civil war going on in Le Lebanon. Mm -hmm. right. And I came up with the idea of doing a song in tribute to my um, my father's homeland. I'm a born Trini, but my parents are Lebanese, you know. And I, mm -hmm. and I said, Andy, why um why don't write a song for me, a soca song? And let's do it as a tribute, a peace, a peace song for Lebanon, which is the, the homeland, you know, the birth of um, my father's land. And he wrote a song. My first my first effort was a song called Soka for Peace in 1989. Mm -hmm. Wayne, um, Wayne Lemassey played the bass on it and he did keyboards. And we recorded it down at Coral Studios with um, Errol Michard. Eric, and Eric Michaud. Eric, Eric yeah, Michaud. Yeah. What I said, Errol, yeah. Eric yeah, yeah, Michaud. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And... We did a music video, and that was a big, big song. That was a big launching for me. It wasn't a big radio hit, but people really appreciated the fact that I pay tribute to my um, my father's homeland. Yeah, and, yeah, that um, that used to play a lot, man. Lebanon, this yeah, one is I, for you, Soka for peace. Yeah, yeah, man, yeah. I remember, I remember this song. What was that? The rhythm. Oh, you mm -hmm. must go see Soka yeah, for yeah. Peace. Soka for Peace. And Maria, I'm showing them there's a, a, a <laughs> plenty album for you there on um, Frederick yeah. Street. Yeah, yeah you would have remember that. It was a, yeah. We did a joint album with my... I did two songs. Um, um, I can't remember the second song I did, but my brother Anthony did two songs as well. We did like a... Like a... a, a I was um, side B and he was side A. And it was called... Um, the name of the album was called like Same Vibe, Same Tribe. Anthony had a song that year called um, O Teresa and July 2001 or something. And I had Lebanon and some other song. It was a, a, a four-song a four album. Mm -hmm. Zoom, on, zoom on, uh, on one side and tone on the other side. And we had a fairly good year, you know. But um, financially, because of the lack of radio airplay, and the type of song it was, the type of message message it was, I didn't really get any paying jobs there. Eh? I only got charity, charity work and jumping on the stage here and there with Second Image and Blue Ventures, doing a little thing in Country Club and, and Lion Civic Centre. And um, It was not a year, a money-making year for me. Thank God, you know, I, I was involved in another business, in, in a family business at that time. If I had to survive off of it, I would have starved, you know. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So you all are. Um, so that's, that's, that's 1990. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we'll, you know, we'll go up further into that, you know. But, you know, it's an interesting thing as you talk about the whole Lebanon thing, right? You know, like you mentioned that we call all, all, um, everybody Syrian, right? You know, that kind of thing, right? And, um, yeah. And, well, you come out and you think it was Lebanon and thing. And, like, people like, um, um, Robert Elias, you know, had this whole mighty trini and, you know, the kind of thing, you know, you're, you're really trying hard to be kind of accepted as trini, you know. Can you, you ever had that problem? Boy, to be honest, Robin, I was so lucky in this industry. Out of the 30 years I've been in music, mm -hmm. um, I spent a couple of years with Atlantic. I, I kind of glad how this thing going because I talk about 1990 mm -hmm. and then from 1990... Um, into 1991. 1990 is when we had the um, the attempted coup, and I spent I spent a couple months with Second Image during that time because Johnny Gonzalez really embraced the song. He loved the Soka for Peace song, although he knew it was not a mashup party mm -hmm. kind of song. So he put me at the side of um, Russell Cadogan and Ghetto Flex mm -hmm. and Trisha Lee Kelshaw. I was a part of that front line, and um. So even though I was singing the Lebanon song, we had, you know, we were singing cover songs. They had big, so big songs with Tambu and by Duke. They had a big song um, as well, too. They didn't have Jump on the Counter for us yet, but they had a song, I think, called Poison. Mm -hmm, Poison yeah. was one of the big songs around that time. So mm -hmm. they were making some waves. I was, I was a guest vocalist with them. And um, so I was very lucky that I was more in the, into the fets. Whereas Mighty Trini and Master Tone, Anthony Saloum, they were trying to make a name in the Calypso tent. Mm -hmm. and around, uh, in the Calypso tent and the Calypso fiesta. And around that time too, Denise Plummer, that was around the time when Denise Plummer had the incident with the toilet paper. Mm -hmm. And 
Mighty Trini was trying to be accepted. And Anthony and all, he get a little orange peel and banana peel and thing felt at him. Mm-hmm. But I was very lucky. That never, never happened hmm. to me. I was <laughs> lucky because I was more in the fit. Right, when you're right. in the fit and you go to perform at a fit and people drink the carib and the stag and, and, and the white oak and they have a little alcohol in the head and the band come on at half past 10, 11 in the night and that bass, that bass guitar hit them. You don't really have that. You don't get a bad vibes from nobody. Once once you perform in and you're not standing up, standing up like a bubble, once you go up in front there and you try and you get them your little, bo- you get them your little wine and you hold the mic and you, <laughs> yeah, you yeah, mix yeah, your little rock, yeah, yeah. rock star talent with the soca. And so I was very lucky. I, I never got that toilet paper and that um, banana, <laughs> banana skin and thing pelt at me, you know what All I mean? Right. So, so that's to answer that. But I, I did have one negative thing in my whole career that happened to me, um, which was I eventually joined Atlantic. I spent about two years with them and we went to Japan and we toured a good part of the world, California, New York. We went to some of the um, Caribbean carnivals. Singing in a Labor Day festival once, um, I had the microphone in hand and I was singing and there was a there was an Afro-Caribbean lady in the crowd um, with dressed in full African wear. And she was she was on the street, on the parade. She wasn't in the mass costume. She was at the side of the street. And while I was singing, I made eye contact with her. And she tell me, what the mother so-and-so, I read her lips. It's like, what yeah. the mother so-and-so are you doing on top day? Come off from there. You, so almost like I didn't belong singing soca music. This white boy mm-hmm. on that truck, you know, like what where you take the microphone and singing, it's almost like, like she didn't realize I was a, a Trinidadian, you know. Mm. She thought maybe she thought I was an American boy trying to fit in in the Caribbean culture, and it it real hurt. Yeah, I wouldn't lie to you, Robin and, and Mario. I mm-hmm. I put on the microphone. Beaver was our musical director at that time of the band. Tony, it was Tony Prescott, myself, and Nicole Graves. We were the front line, mm-hmm. and I I put the mic down and I, Beaver said, "What happened, Zoom?" I said, Beaver, I wasn't, I didn't get into the Elvis thing as yet. I was still performing under the name Zoom. Mm -hmm. And I said, Beaver, boy, a woman there tell me to get my ass off the truck, boy. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut, yeah. No, you could say, no, you could say anything. You could say, you could, you could, you could could use any kind of profanity. We're not, um, (laughs) yeah. Oh, all right, yeah. She said, you know, ready lips, get your so-and-so ass off the truck. And and he said, no, he said, no, Zoom, you will get that, boy. Pick up the mic and. It took about five, ten minutes for me to catch myself. Wow. And it, it mm. really hurt me on that trip. And yeah, I boy. I kind of felt like I, like I didn't belong. But that didn't last long. I, I, I picked up the pieces and I moved on. And, and you know, and, and that was only one time that I felt how um, Denise Plummer or Mighty Trini and them would have felt. Oh, okay. um, other than that, I've, yeah. I've been good so far, you know. Well, you know, yeah, Denise Plummer was able to, to come from that and... And win the crown, you know, some years yeah. after, you know. Chinese have yeah. a way, once they believe you have belly, they just leave you alone. <laughs> yeah. It's not a proof to them that you have belly, you know. I mean, if you if you only cover, <laughs> then it's, you know, like in school, long time, if they get your fatigue, if you take the fatigue, they get your more, right? So, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. That, is how, that is how the, the pecan culture is, you know. But, yeah, mm. man. Yeah, but no, but you you was a wrong man. I remember going all kind of place. You used to go my arrow with me, you know. We used to move wrong and thing, you know. You you had a kind of yeah. a, you had a trini kind of vibe, you know. Right. You took me, yeah. I remember that my arrow, right. arrow trip. You took me to meet um Lord Zandoli. Is, is right. Lemo, Zan- right. Mm-hmm. Zandoli. Zandoli was my wife's um uncle. Lemo uncle. Right. Lemo uncle. Right. I, can you um remind me what part of my arrow? Um, that is because I go my arrow regularly now, you know. All right. And, that and is when it. you reach the, okay, when you reach the, when you find, when you're going to my arrow, you reach right on and then you turn right. And then where the market is there, right? Instead right. of turning right. left by the market, you go straight and then you, the, the road kind of forks into, you go left and go, you keep left and go up the hill. And Zando is living on right. top of the hill there. There's a museum now. His brother, um, his brother Michael Anthony, the writer, is 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 Zando's brother, 
Michael Anthony. Anthony. Right, yeah. Who wrote who wrote Green Days by the River and thing? Michael Anthony. Wow. Right. Um, um Sandoli is Sylvester Anthony. And he he Michael Anthony is his brother. Right? Mario, you know that boy? No, I didn't know that. Right. And, no, no, and no, no, no. I didn't know that boy. And Lemo Lemo Wayne Lemacy's mother was was her maiden name was Annie Lee's Lemacy. So you know they, yeah. they you know. Um so yeah, and because I I met him, I begged him for years to come back and sing and thing till I finally got him in ninety four or something, so to come back out and do a show with me called Rockai. So in in Mass Camp. Mass Camp Pub. It, it out it on YouTube and, and all of them things. Yes. Right? With them, right. Yes, yeah, that I was remember. my that was my concert. So, uh, you had mm -hmm. a series, yeah. I remember yeah. it. You had DVDs and thing yet? Mm, yeah, back in them days, yeah. But um, I think yeah, it had no yeah. product right now with it, right? It on, but it's on YouTube. Yeah. You could go on YouTube yeah. and see it. Um, yeah, so yeah, man. So yeah, you you was grounded, man. We are we we, we didn't fright <laughs> we didn't frighten for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that was that was the Atlantic era, and then something happened between that time, boy Mario, where mm -hmm. um. Cliff Harris, the, the mighty Cliff Harris was a, <laughs> a promoter and band leader at the time where he always tried new stuff. And I started to get a sense that they didn't want me in the band anymore. It, I don't want to call, it was like a technical fire. Tony Prescott gave me a heads up and he said, you know, Zoom, you better, you better check yourself. You're with the band about two years now. And... And I always felt like um, second place to Tony Prescott. He was the guy that had the hits. He had All Aboard. He had Follow Me. He had most of the hits. I was like the, I was like the side B man. In most, in most soca bands where you have more than one singer, you always find there's a there's a lead lead man, the man that will always have that the hits would be written for that person. And then if there's a female vocalist, you would always find. Um, yeah, she, she would she would do the woman songs. She yeah she right. would do the woman song. I mean yeah you remember in the days like with Sunil Dempster. Right. And, um, mm -hmm. That is one of the big names I call it. She wasn't was it song rap? She wasn't when she had a big song. No, she was in in Blue Ventures. Blue Ventures, Blue Blue Ventures. Ventures. right, yeah. right. right. But, that was the days Ronnie yeah. Ronnie McIntosh was in Blue Ventures. Right. So you as I say, so you find where you have a soca band with with two or three male singers. You always have the the man rat. And then everybody else had to take a side. So I didn't mind. I mean, for two years, I, I, I took a side um, next to Tony Prescott. I learned a lot from him. We, we toured. We spent a, um, a couple summers in Japan working at the um, Ocean Dome mm -hmm. um, Resort. It was a, a fantastic experience for me. Um, very professional treatment they gave to the band. They put us up in hotels. They fed us. We had our own tour bus back and front. We did three sessions a day and... It was it was like really working as a full time musician, you know. And um, but after a couple of years, I realized I wasn't reaching anywhere, and I decided I would go solo. And I left Atlantic, and that is when the idea for being Soka Elvis was born. So if, what what year was that? If all you understand where I reach right now, by that yeah. time, I'm in my thirties. By that time, I'm about thirty three years old. You know. You know, 33, 34 mm. years old. Mm -hmm. Kind of into my 30s now. Had spent a lot of time with different, with, with about 10 different bands. I told you, like the five major ones would be like Atlantic, Second Image, Frantic, um, Zoom and Rhythm Division. That was the one I had in the days with Andy and and, and then Zoom and... So there about five, you're looking at about five major bands. And then in between, I experimented with little fusion bands and that kind of thing. So by that time, I was fed up of being a band leader or being a, a singer, frontline singer in a band. And I went to, I took a year off probably in 1997 or 98. And I went to Calypso Spectacular. And I saw this guy, um, Andy Stevenson, the, the oh, right, right, Soka right, Michael right, Jackson. Right. right. Yeah. Okay. And, right. And right. that's, that that's give, how I got the vision. That's what, that gave you the idea. Right, okay, that's when cool. I got the idea. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't, as I was telling Alex, Alex um, Assing 
earlier on in the interview, I never, I was never Elvis fan, you know. Mm -hmm. To me, I grew up in the 60s, and to me, Elvis, Elvis was, by that time, Elvis was an old man, only, only old people, like my big brother and my uncles and them, listen to Elvis. I grew up, I grew up on, on Michael Jackson, Jimi Hendrix, Mick Jagger, mm -hmm. you know, um, Led Zeppelin, Sly and the Family Stone, um, Janis Joplin. That was the music I grew up on. So Elvis, Elvis was an old man. Right, um, right. But he was a but, but he was a phenomenon, eh? Like you know, yeah, yeah. Of, all the of Elvis course, in, impersonators and all them kinds of things. Yeah, no, no. Well, that's that's what I'm trying to say. So what is he really made his name and catered to the younger people in the fifties? That they call that the, the slim Elvis. Back right. Yeah, 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 had, yeah. When he had uh, the hung dog and doing the right. cool and heartbreak hotel and into the sixties when all the all the big stars like. Mick Jagger and Led Zeppelin and Jimi Hendrix and these and Jim Morrison, when these guys started to become famous and started to get number one hits, Elvis got into the movies. He tried something else because he couldn't compete against them, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then he joined the army and he was all for the grid. And then he made a comeback in the 70s. And that's when you had the, 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 the more chubby, the chubby. Right, Elvis yeah. That is the one that used to perform in Las Vegas. In Las Vegas, right. and that is the image, that is the image I portrayed. Not the younger Elvis. I portrayed the more kind of Elvis, you know, because of spectacular. Seeing Andy right. Stevenson in spectacular that year, performing as Michael Jackson was a blow mine. I got the idea. Well, if they have a a local Michael Jackson, they can have a a, a local Elvis. Mm -hmm. And that's when I came up. I designed the whole thing to be a show, not to not to be a radio, not to be a radio hit, um, to be a, a kind of a Humorous entertainment, but proper singing. I mean, not a Rex West kind of thing. Right, you know, right. the key mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. that kind of. Uh, you know what I mean? And, uh, Rex Rex was a comedy act. <laughs> a comedy, yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. So I was a bit of a comedy, but yeah, 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 a yeah. Bit, a bit of talent mixed up with the comedy. You know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, boy, Liza, um Mario, you was going to say something. So, so and with took of Elvis, where did you perform? Places you went. With um, performing soca Elvis on the whole, where did it take you? What what parts of the globe you went doing soca Elvis? All right. Well, in in 1998 when I decided to come out with it, um, actually I didn't do so well that year. Um, Andy Stevenson was still on the scene, and we kind of competed. I I I've been very honest, and I say this openly. I couldn't. I couldn't compete against a man like Andy Stevenson. He was a phenomenal performer. His makeup, he would he would reach at the Calypso tent like three hours before um, call time. He would make up. He had his whole show planned out what he was going to do, where I just, you know, I had a nice costume. I would I would reach there half hour before pawn my costume, hope to, hope to, hope to perform. If I get one encore, I was lucky. And so I did have a great year in 1998. And I gave it a rest in 99. And then in the year 2000, when the Lord Kitchener passed away, I went to his funeral. This was at the cathedral. This was at the cathedral in um, next to Woodford Square. I think that's the Anglican Cathedral. Mm -hmm. I went to the Lord Kitchener's funeral, and there were many artists there. And Claude Martineau approached me, and he said... Um, he said, you know, Zoom, you, you try this thing one year, you need to come back and, you know, think it over. Come back and see if you could reinvent it. And um, he said, Andy Stevenson is no longer with us. He left the country and he went away to, in England. We're looking for somebody to to fill that spot. So I was so happy because I knew, <laughs> I knew, okay, we don't have Andy Stevenson again. So maybe I, I, I could give it, um, I could put some more effort into it and try to fill his shoes now, now that I, I realized you know, after kind of failing for one year and, and 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 realizing that I had to put more effort into it, I said, well, you know what? I'm going to come out with more energy. With I'll come out with more energy, a faster song, and I will try to, to give it my all. And from that, and that was it. I think it was in 2001. That was it. I went out there with a, um, a remake of Elvis's song, The Hung Dog. Mm -hmm. I mix I mix up that with Shaggy song. It wasn't me. So I mix a dancehall song with a rock and roll song, <laughs> and I did, I did um, 
you ain't nothing but a hung dog. It wasn't me. As a, what you call a mashup now? Just, just sure. give me a little chorus of it song. Mm. Yeah. The, the, um, the, the, co- the first into the chorus, like, um, it wasn't me in the pajama party, whining on a gal with the see-through mini. It was me that you see last night, whining and guiding in the moonlight. And then, um, and then I went into the Elvis, um, you ain't nothing but a hound dog, whining all the time. Hey, you ain't nothing but a, um, you ain't ever caught a rabbit and you ain't no friend of mine. And then I'm going back to, it wasn't me in the pajama party. What? That kind of, and the crowd went really crazy for it because Shaggy, Shaggy was real big at the time. And... So to incorporate a, a hit song with an Elvis song, and then I would get up some Marshall and some some Dennis Bell for kind of moves in between. I started getting encores, and I was like the new I was like the new Michael Jackson on the scene. So Soka Elvis started rising, and and that during that time I was walking back one night after performance. Spectacular was still on Henry Street. I was walking back to my car, and a guy said, "Hey Elvis." You know who I am? And I say, nah, he say, watch, um, my name is Casey. Uh, I'm, I'm originally from Sanaki, other kind of freshwater mm-hmm. Yankee accent. Eh? <laughs> he say, my name is Casey. Um, I live in New York now. I'm a truck driver, but I do an act called the Soka James Brown. I say, what? I say, but have mad people like like me and Michael Jackson. Now we have a Soka James Brown boy. Um, Mario, you ever heard of him? I know Casey. Soka I heard the name Casey. Yeah, yeah Casey. Casey, Casey, the James Brown of Soka. Yeah, so he said, um, he said, I want you, I have a Calypso 10 called um, Casey's Hideaway in mm-hmm. in Brooklyn. I want to book you. You know, he had this kind of trainee American yeah, accent. Yeah, yeah. He said, I want to book you, man. Um, give me your number. And we exchanged numbers. Them days, they didn't know WhatsApp and Blackberry and thing. Hmm. So it was actual phone calls. He took my number. And I actually went to um, Labor Day Carnival. That was my first trip. That was like 2001 or 2002. I had a red. I remember I had a red Elvis suit with all the um, with all the, the diamantes and thing on it. And he put me on a show, and I mash up the place there in New York. He put me on a truck too for Labor Day, <laughs> and he was on the truck doing some James Brown, <laughs> Soka James Brown stuff. I was doing some Soka Elvis stuff, and <clears throat> after that, he would bring me up like. Five, six times for the year, he would be doing shows, and, and I'd be doing shows with, mm. with Sparrow, with Power, with Lord Blakey, mm. with um, other acts like um, Singing Francine, mm-hmm. Calypso Rose. So I would be doing these shows at the Casey Hideaway with these big legends in the business, you know? And then from there now, um, from being in Brooklyn, five, six times on a yearly basis. I got a call from a guy called the Mighty Tiger from London. I don't know if you all know the Mighty, not the... Not, not oh, the Growling Tiger, the Mighty Tiger. Not the Growling Tiger. <laughs> mighty, the Mighty Tiger. He left Trinidad as a little boy and he went to England and he started a, a Calypso tent called the London Calypso Tent, hosted by the Association of British... Calypsonians. Okay, all right. Um, mm-hmm. That's where you have like um, singers like Cleopatra and Kate these Kate are um, these are Trini, Trini artists based out in um in London. In UK. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in London. Right. And when I went, when I went, I was by that time it was two thousand and three or two thousand and four. Cyclops didn't join join <laughs> the actors yet. Um, I went up on my own. And when I went up there, the BBC was all over me, all over me for interviews. I was on BBC television. I was on BBC radio. They even wanted me for a game show. Um, but unfortunately, I couldn't stay. They wanted, they have, um, they had Elvis's, Elvis tribute acts from all over the world that was doing a kind of a family feud, a British version to family feud, where they had different versions of Elvis. They had a, a Russian Elvis a Polish Elvis, an Irish Elvis, an English Elvis, all the unusual Elvis tribute acts from all over the world. And they heard about Soka Elvis, and they asked me to join the cast, and I had to come back home. My youngest son was starting primary school that year. One of my one of my kids, no, not, yeah, I think my second son, 2003, yeah, he was starting 
Sin Monica. Well, Andy, you will know my kids. Um, yeah, yeah, Jake Sin Monica. In well, Sin Monica's that year. You know, I didn't want him. I didn't want to miss his first day in school, and I refused that. You, you know something? This is a, a, a sort of recurring thing, eh? That yeah. you, you always hear these stories of somebody big Disney acts for thing, and then somebody will just find that no, I, um, I had to go back to New York to do some kind of thing, or or some leader yeah. of the band say that um he done gave four tires. For your car already, and he coming home, he ain't come for that. And this is a recurring thing. Why we just why 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 we just can't ever stay? <laughs> but that would that, that I feel that would be big, you know. Yeah, that's what that's what the producer of the show told me. She said, Soka Elvis, you are missing out on a big this is a huge game show in in Europe, well, well, especially in Britain, in in England, she said this is the equivalent to like Jeopardy or Family Feud, in you know in America. She said millions of viewers are going to see you, and there's no act like you. They say she said all these other Elvis tribute guys they sing Elvis songs. She said you have, have the most unusual Elvis act out because you are the only one of its kind um, representing the Caribbean. You know, and um, and boy, it was a real battle. She said, she said, I will pay for you because my ticket was booked. I think this was like to come back home September the first of that year, and this thing was like on September the third. And she said, we will, we will call Caribbean Airlines, and you know, and we do your ticket. We'll pay for a hotel for you for the the two the two extra nights you're gonna spend here with us. And wow, and. I turn it, I turn it down. Boy, it down. you see, mm-hmm. I don't know. Um, it, it, it seems to me, right? Not just you, right? The whole story of people in the music business, it is almost as though it is just um a something we do by the way. You know, we have a whole, yes. we have a whole other life. And and then we just take a little time out from that life and go and do a little music thing. But then we had to run back. You know, it is it is all right. It doesn't seem like we 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 full time. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> yes, and that many uh, of us and and you know earlier in the conversation before we went live, you you had asked me something about you know what, what you think the problem is about um, soca music and thing. And that when we reached to that. What you just said there, you hit the you hit the nail on the head. That that is correct. What you're saying there, as right. you say, that tire, that thing with the four tires, he managed to bring home. I hear that story with some right. Tires. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but that that was a sto- that, that was a story with Germany Brass, right? Um, yeah. Germany Brass performed somewhere in Canada, and then some fella hear them in some fet, some fella from Motong Records, and the fella he um he booked he booked like a venue. And he brought them in um, to perform. He tell them, look again, only a gig. And they come to this gig, and in the gig, they realize it's only he and his family in the gig, right? So he tell them, well, look, he booked that just as an audition to hear them, right? So he yeah. said, well, all right, I would like you all to come to over to Detroit with me and meet with thing, 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 right? And the owner of the band, at the time, he said, um, God, fellas, me ain't come here for that, you know. He say. We done do all the shows we had to do already. Collect. I done buy my four tires for my van. So I going home. <laughs> yeah. It has stories. Yes. It, yes. They, oh, they have plenty stories like that. Another yeah. one. H two O flow. H two O flow has a, a a story to tell like that too, where they were on the verge of making it, mm-hmm. and they started to get um rock roll and rock gave me the story. You right. Know, rock, yeah. Right? Rock and rock. rock. He's do camera. Yeah, and rock thing, gave yeah. me the story where they were all kind of bunched up living in, in an apartment together and frustration started to set in and like they were on the verge of making it and two of them wanted to stay and two of them wanted to come back home because, you know, they had... I, I don't want to give the wrong... The yeah, wrong I know, I know, but it's... Like it's... The, the girl... The girl vex with them and they are way too long. Right. The girl will break up with them if they if they stay any longer. And so it had plenty, plenty stories like that, you know? Yeah. And yeah. then they had the 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 the, the pan men, the pan guys who 
um, somebody from Disney see in Miami and then he tell them, um, all right, he want them to fly to, to Orlando, to come to Orlando tomorrow to do audition for, for Disney to do something. And then the leader of the band say, boy, oh God, let me, I had to go back to New York. A girl come in to check me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like that, you know, mm. you know, things like that, yeah. you know, it, it's like, boy, so... All right, so all right, right. Before we go there, right? This is that is how we go in and we we examining yeah. this now. And we will see. We will try to get your opinion on how is the best way for us to go forward. But I think I want to hear the rest of the Soka Elvis story. When you you right. came back down that time with the with, with the, the thing from England didn't happen. That, but then what happened again after that? Right. Okay. What happened? That was my first summer there. I spent another summer there, and that's when I decided to introduce Cyclop into my act. So we get we enter 2004, mm -hmm. 2005 kind of thing. Um, Cyclop became part of my act. I can't tell you exactly how I decided to approach Cyclop. I think um, I think maybe Spectacular did a a clash with um. Errol Fabian had a tent back then. Um, uh huh. Yeah. You remember the um, name? Uh... Um, oh gosh, and I really remember that. Under, no, no, no. under the big, under, under a big tent, under a big tent, he put up in tongue, right? Uh, actual tent, he had it was a, like a comedy tent, right? Um, um oh gosh, boy, oh, again, old, yeah. again, old, not that, yeah, yeah. Um, we, we'll remember, yeah, 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 yeah. I remember the tent, tent. Uh, yeah, um, I remember the tent, yeah. um, right? We did a clash, we did a clash with them, and I saw Cyclop. And at that time, a lot of people used to think he was Bungie Gallin's brother. Right. Um, yeah, because but he came right. out with Bungie. He was Bungie's friend. He came friend. out with Bungie in Araga. He grew up with Bungie. He came out with Bungie for a year. Yeah. Right. The had, the first, the, yeah, the first year that Bungie... Um, the first year that Bungie hit um, with, with that... Yeah, that was done by my studio at the time, by Engine Room. Um, um, right. It was a... Uh, bam, bam, ba da 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 um, um se send that rhythm crazy it was supposed right. it and was one, it was supposed to be um the girl who died Aaliyah had a song pam pam da 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 and um Daryl Braxton God rest him God rest his soul um yeah. Daryl did like a soca version of that and it was supposed to be sung by silhouettes silhouettes right. were um were Nadia Batson um, Lauren, who sings with uh, um, Alessia Jagasa in um, Los Alumnos right. de San Juan, and her sister, three of them were the silhouettes. They used to sing all the, all the backups in our studio. And he had... That's right. And that song was for them to do. And they fell out with Daryl. And they decided they're not doing it. And then Bungie... I think it was Bungie had already worked in the studio with Ital D some time before. Yes. Right? But this time he came back. Um, who brought him was Victor Donawa. Victor, Victor Donawa. Donawa. Yeah. Victor, Victor Donawa yeah. brought him in the studio and say, Well, yeah, this guy really good and blah, blah, blah. And then we just told him, Well, look, we had this thing here if I could come up with something for it. And that was the song that made him. Um, wow, yeah. Um, but all them, them is Arima boys. Yeah. Bunch, right. I think was yeah. A, well, yeah. Well, he and Victor, Arima, Victor was yeah, some Arima, Victor right? And, and Cyclop. Right. And Cy yeah. Cyclop used to go to school with him and all kind of thing. Yeah. Cyclop name is Nicholas. Yeah. Nicholas. Nicholas. Right. Nicholas Alan Emmanuel. Right. Right. So they used to call him. Um, Bonji used to call him Nicholas so, the Rhythm Rider. Yeah. The Rhythm Rider. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. So, so basically, we, we did a, a show there with Errol. And I saw Nicholas, um, Cyclop, and I, I, I was starting to, um, I think I was thinking to myself, I was starting to get a little stale in the Calypso tent, and I need to introduce, I need to up the act a little bit, because by that time I was already three, four years in the, in the same type of costume, in the, the same, um, same, so same style Elvis. of songs, where I would, mm -hmm. yeah, where I would take an Elvis song and mix it with a, you know, and I started to feel... I started um, auditioning for Soka Monarch back at that time, and I, I could never make a final. I was only making semifinals. And I say, you know what? 
I, I hear about this little boy. Bungie was big, and I hear about this little fella, this little short man who's Bungie brother. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna ask him, and you know he he's he, he's a famous um, comedy act. I'm gonna ask him to team up with me and do like a Austin Powers. Right. Uh, me kind of thing now. I dress him up just like me. <laughs> all right. I, I, I bought him backstage in, in Jean Pierre Complex. I say, hey, Cyclop. So, Kelvis here, boy, let me do a song together now. And he say, yeah. Yeah, boy, let me do it now. Mm. And we went by Kenny Phillips that year. That was by that time, it's about 2004 or five or something. We went by Kenny Phillips and we did a song called Speed. Um, it. Mario, you, you get all them record, but none of them record <laughs> never really hit the radio. <laughs> I drop every time I do CDs, I used to drop it by Mario. For um yeah, see if you could it. sell, well, like, yeah, sell a little ten for me, I end up saying but give away the rest. <laughs> uh, Daddy Scratch always I wouldn't like to hear Daddy Scratch always embrace me and, and give me real positive vibes. And I know this song ain't playing on radio, yeah, but still <laughs> Mario and Daddy Scratch always embrace me and say, man, leave it here, man. We'll give the DJ something for you, you know? So mm -hmm. we did a song called Speed. Speed is taken from the melody of um, Stand By Me. Although Stand By Me was Benny King, it wasn't an Elvis song. It was from that era. Mm -hmm. So the song sort of went like, um, Oh, when the lights go low, mm -hmm. baby, and we whine in slow. Take out your rag, take out your flag. And wave with me, wave with me. Um, now is it time to take a wave? Uh, na, 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 misbehave. Mm -hmm. And then the song builds up. Um, we were speed when we whining. Speed when we whining. Give me speed when we waving. Speed when we waving. Speed when we jumping. Speed when we joking. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, uh. So we had an act where both of us would do a, a kind of a dance together. When we reach the joking part, we were speed when we joking. Eh, eh, both of us, uh, we would dress up in these racing suits, like which is a kind of a um, like in um, in the five hundred kind of racing suits. Mm -hmm. And me and Cyclop mash up. So Elvis, so Elvis was reborn as um, a bungee brother, and Elvis mashing up the place. The song ain't playing on the radio, but mm -hmm. the kids loved us when we would perform at um, spectacular children shows. The mm -hmm. children went crazy. So I. I became like the new Andy Stevenson act. That's what it, it really started to grow and grow. And then Cyclops joined the, 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 the thing. And we were signing autographs. We were, we make <laughs> we make two Soka Monarchs in a row. 2004, 2005. Then he went to London with me. Then he started to go New York with me to Casey shows. We started to go Antigua Carnival, Miami Carnival. And then we started really traveling. But what happens? How far are they to? Uh, How far you all reach with it? I mean, beside the, the, the places with the Trini style carnivals and things and where the West Indian diaspora is, all you went beyond that? Just same old, same old BBC, BBC News and, and English television and being interviewed and we didn't we didn't reach any further than 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 that really. We didn't get to go places like like Germany to the big music festivals and that kind of thing. Um, I was in London, London, New York, and Miami all Carnival. Right, because, and but same I know, old, same old diaspora. Because I know you all did, uh, like, it sounded to me because I saw Nicholas, well, Cyclop. I saw him, I didn't see him for some years, and then I see him, and then he tell me, boy, I was toying everywhere with, with, um, with, 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 with Soka Elvis. And he tell me, um, I know finish and build my house and thing. I said, well, all I had to do real gigs, boy, for heat to build house off of that. Well, we, make, <laughs> we make some nice pongs. We make some nice pongs. Right, they took care of us and fed us and put us up in apartments and thing in London. And <clears throat> So he was able to save his money mm -hmm. and come back and, you know, but I wouldn't say I could have built a whole house with it. So maybe well, me, it, you know, he must be had other money from somewhere. And, and, and <laughs> the, you know what I mean? Yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> you know, it, yeah, it, man. Well, um, so how long that so called this thing last, boy? We did pretty well in. Well, that um, that was it. 2004, 2005, and then in 2006, spectacular closed the doors to to the basic Calypso tent, and that was it. We were out of work in 2006, and I I took a rest, 
And I took a break from music that year. And in 2007, I met a music producer called um, Big Rich, the Pungalungs. All right, the right. Pungalungs uh, Factory. Right. Yeah, yeah. Pungalungs Factory. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I just met him. I don't know how. Oh, Choco. Choco told me about Big Rich. All right. Um, Choco was the one, actually, and a guy called Tracy Donnell. You know Tracy Donnell? Mm -hmm. Tracy D. Mm -hmm. Tracy D, yeah, yeah, I think so. I Tracy think, D yeah. has a nice, nice voice. He had a hit a couple of years ago called um, The Way You Dance, The Way You Dance, The Way You Dance. You know him, Mario, Tracy? Well, I know he had a song called Drunkard of Something. Drunkard of Something. Um, but, but you had no, singing. No, that's me and That is you and him singing Drunk, that song. Drunkard of the part, Drunkard of the, part, of the County. Yeah. That's me and Tracy. That's me, Tra me, uh, that's me and Tracy and Hitman. Yeah, and, and we did sing. a remake and, and of um, Kenny Rogers. Yeah, that's me and Tracy. Yeah, so Tracy and Choco. Choco was a guy that sang "Roll Back" on it. One of one of my big hits from back in Rhythm mm -hmm, Division mm -hmm, days. Mm -hmm. So we stayed friends. Um, and Choco say, "Hey, you need to jump into the Chutney Soka thing, man." And Ricky Jai, Ricky Jai and Chris Garcia used to encourage me to, and I never took it on until Choco took me by Big Rich. And um, my first big hit in the chutney industry was a song called Rum Do Bother Me. Yeah. That song, well, my career, my so That was in 2010. That was around 2010, wrong, wrong, about 2010. 2010, you know the, you know the yeah. thing. We had, the yeah. drunk cut of, we had the drunk cut of the party song in 2009, but when I had um, Rum, Rum Do Bother Me, Ravi B, did the background vocals and the musical arrangement on the song. Big Rich was the producer. And that, that song, right now, that song viral on TikTok. If you go and look up that song on TikTok, they have hundreds of videos where people use it. I don't get anything from it. Somebody uploaded it as a TikTok song. And I feel good. It kind of keeps the song going. Mm -hmm. It was in that era, you know, of the Chutney Soka. That was by far my biggest song in the Chutney industry. Um, I had a, other other songs too, but that that is the one that crossed over to the um to the Fed something. Up to now they play it. Yeah, I in see. Guyana. I see it on YouTube. Um, you know, you have about um six hundred and something thousand views. Views, of, of, yeah. yeah. I mean, not any millions. Like some of the more more recent songs. Mm. I mean, YouTube wasn't that big. Yeah. Ten years ago, when you know six hundred thousand views is a is a good bit from that time. Now. Now, when these Chutney Soka guys come out, they have these Guyanese artists. Um, this year came out with some songs, and within a couple of months, they have 1.5 million views and thing. That, you know, it, times times mm -hmm. changing. People going for the YouTube and thing a lot more now on the the Spotify and and the Apple iTunes and all that. You know, but back then in 2010, people were still into the CDs and and, and radio airplay was the popular thing. You know. All right, but tell um, me, I know you made a lot of money off of gigs, but did you sell any CDs as well? No, no. Any okay. attempt I had at selling CDs because Mario would know I always yeah. used to drop at least 50 or 100 CDs. I used to go by this guy. Um, I don't know if Mario ever produced any, um, actually made copies for me. I think maybe once, but I used to go by Zach, Zach Esau. Zach Esau, um, down in, in Woodbrook. I used to do, yeah. I used to distribute for you. Zach is that's his mailing son, right? And mailing son. Yeah, yeah, I know him, man. Yeah. Yeah. I used to go by him. He had a nice he had a nice uh, machine where he would make nice right. um, copies, cover, yeah. Cover yeah, yeah, photos yeah, yeah, yeah. and thing of you and and I used to drop them off my Mario and Yeah, I used to Honestly boy, it. I used to get so frustrated with all the with all the airplay. Um I would just Mario would say, Boy, come back by I sell a ten for you at twenty <laughs> and the yeah. balance of them I would put in the car trunk or give it away and so I never really sold any CDs and I think a big part my music career I, I work on a lot of apps and I I regret now that I didn't there was a guy that used to be a roadie for Charlie's Roots his, his name was um, Ken Elder they call him Country Country yeah yeah like mm -hmm. my boy Country fell off a truck once in a caravan I was there I was there I was working on the truck yeah. with him when he fell off I was there holding off a line and he fell off a yeah, truck yeah. and he walks with a limp he, he was one of my roadies during the years with, with Andy and Lemo and thing right mm -hmm. and Country's Country's used to say Zoom he used to say Mike all these different studios you're running about and trying this and trying that. He say, 
your problem is anybody write a song for you, you're taking it. And you're going by you're going by the studio, you're going by that studio. You say they have they have Pelham. Pelham was a hit maker at the time. They have they had less than Paul. He said, what you need to do if you want to get airplay, you had to do like what Tambu and Rudder and, and, and all these guys were doing at the time. You need and might even Mighty Trini. Look at Karita Banka. That was that was a less than Paul production. Mm. And Who's our songwriter that passed away recently? Um, Divine. Divine. Divines. When f- Divines. When's yeah. for Divines. Divines. Yeah, when's for Joker Divines. He said you need to go by a, a, an established songwriter and you need to go by a Pelham or by a Les Dan Paul and try try it. He said try it and you will see the difference in the production that you're getting and the airplay and he started to frustrate me. Country started to frustrate me. And he kept pushing that, pushing that, and I felt I wanted to be different. I was going, I was going by Chasu. Chasu at the time mm-hmm. had his little thing. He was working up the hill in, in Goodwood Park by these guys, AudioCon, AudioCon Studios by Andrew Bernard. You know what? Yeah, right. I know. I know this. Remember them? Yeah. For Joe, that's for Joe and them. No, that wasn't f- Mark. Audiocon no, so, wasn't Fojo. Fojo was the one lower down. This one is the one you go straight up the hill and swing back around. Up the hill, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, Fojo was at the front one. Yeah. Right. Um, I'm trying to remember Fojo, but this, Audiocon was one. Right. This was Robert, Robert Johnson, Johnson and them guys. Robert Johnson. Right. And, As Audiocon. And yeah. um, for, well, he worked at Fojo as well, too. Which he is. He kind of... Chasu Studio right now in Belmont, I think, was originally Fojo Studio. Um, Star Song. Star yeah, song. that is that is directly opposite where I am here now. Right. My house. What? Directly opposite my house. You in Belmont right now? Yeah, yeah. That is where that is where we're talking to you from. Directly yeah. opposite that that where Chasu Studio is. Yeah, I know, I know the studio. I, I come there from time to time, um and you know, just check him out. Yeah, so at the time you have you had to remember um Star Songs and Audio Corn and these guys, they were never really known to um, produce big soca songs, right? As I said, at the time it was it was Les Dan Paul, um, Pelham, your studio at the time in um you at the time in, in Marval. In Boss, yeah, yeah. What, what do you call that? In general. In general. In Marval, next to Pelais? Yeah, next to Pelais, yeah. Um yeah. in general. Was the name of my studio, was, yeah. Engine room. My studio was engine, engine room. room. Yeah. Uh, engine room. Oh, go on. How I could forget engine room. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that was the place. Coral Coral Studios was kind of phasing out by then because people were more going into the drum machines and less live. Tell me if I, I, on right on the right track, Robin. That's correct what I'm saying? Yeah, and then they had a fire. They had a fire by cage. By well, coral. They had a, like coral, a, a little yeah. fire and then they opened back after. But but yeah. it, it, it depended on what kind of camp you was in, right? Where you would have recorded stuff, eh? you know, like if you're with the, yeah. the kind of Chasu, um, Fojo, myself, thing, is that kind right. of thing. And then, then you would have had the less done by so and thing if you're in South by Kenny, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah and, the next, and the next guy, right, Kenny, I, and the next guy, um, oh God, you're a man in South uh-huh. Aibo. Yeah, yeah, Aibo. Ibo, I never, I never recorded with Ibo. I did go and talk to Ibo once, and so my problem, my problem, I think, guys, is that I never, um, I never stayed focused, and I, on, on trying to capture political, uh, 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 to capture, uh, like my own song now. Because if you check Soka for Peace, was a big song with live brass and live percussion that was in choral. Mm-hmm. And then the following year, I did a song called Who Want to Go Can Go. I went with Sean Bartholomew. So it, it went yeah, from and remember a that song. song. That's you know, who want to go, cut like, go. Who want to stay, yeah. cut stay. They so. can stay in Trinidad, that I, I know. We didn't talk we about that song. Better, that was next we, yeah, that was a big song. Kind of big, yeah. That was mm-hmm. a big song for me as well, but it was a non-money-making song. It wasn't a, a fet song. It was a patriotic song. And um, But you ain't got no, so gig, no gigs with it. I ain't think no set of song. Um, how the music business used to run in them days, boy. You used to try to get airplay from certain radio yeah, stations, Mario and then when you get it, you get a hit, and you would get some work. Yeah, you, you would get some. You would get some work in the fets, and then if if the song big enough, the promoters from outside would be here for carnival, and they would have book you, right? But and then the only thing you would have really make from certain people, some of the same promoters or whoever might have had compilations. 
and they might have take everybody's song, you might have get a, a six thousand dollars um for the thing. But the, 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 yeah, but the sales yeah. of the records ne uh, the C D and thing never really do nothing that big, you understand? So yeah. um yeah. so let me find out now. Um a lot of things like in this show, right? A lot of things a lot of people did things to actually try to make it outside, try to get a bigger market outside for the music, right? Was that ever your focus or you just kind of went with the West Indian thing, the same kind of within the West Indian diaspora, the little, the little hustle? Or, or you, you ever tried to like carry it beyond? I'm so glad you asked that and I actually, mm -hmm. I actually forgot about that, but as you mentioned it, there was a there was a period in time where I did some demo songs with um, Stephen Ensenus and your brother-in-law Wayne. Mm -hmm. We created a little project called Let's Be Frank. We um, we sort of the music from it was a sort of a um, dance, like in those days, you know, it had the bands like um, Tears for Fears and Simply Red mm -hmm. and Duran Duran and Flock of Seagulls. That was the 80s kind of, a, um, uh, I don't want to call it punk rock. I think they call it new wave. It was like a new wave music that yeah. Stephen Ensenas, Disco, and Wayne, they really embraced that type of music. I don't know if you know, but mm -hmm. your brother-in-law your brother -in -law don't like soccer music too much, yeah? Well, he, he, he wouldn't tell you that. Or like the crossover. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, he's still he producing music now. He's living in where? In, um, the Bay Area, San Francisco. Oh. He's living in San yeah. Diego. Um, San, not San Diego, not San Jose, which is like San, more yeah. up near out of San Francisco. And yeah. like, yeah, but he, you know, yeah, but he's a man into raw food and all kind of thing now. Yeah, and, um, yeah. You know, yeah. and so, so yeah. These guys, these guys believed a lot in me and they, they said, they, you know, back then, in them days, I wasn't the Elvis as yet. I, that was still the 90s. And so this is a little part, a, a little part here telling you about that I didn't mention before, but as you asked this. So they believed that I had the voice to to make it t in in a new wave type of fashion. Like, the, as I said, the kind of flock of seagulls or um, Duran Duran kind of voice. And we did a, we did a four song demo and we, we named the album Let's Be Frank and they were shopping it around. I, I don't know to who, but I actually shopped it around to Hollywood. In those days, in those days, it was cassettes, you know. Um, we didn't even have DVDs back then. And it was too expensive to, to press a record of a demo. So I did some cassettes and some artwork, some cover photos and thing of the band. And we called the album, Let's Be Frank. And I shopped it around to Hollywood Records in Hollywood, California and a couple other record companies in Florida, and it was rejected by everybody. I think I shopped it around to Disney Records too. And I got actual letters in those days, it wasn't email, I got letters saying, you know, thank you for submitting your um, your talent to us, and, and but we're sorry at this time, we are not looking for yeah, 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 yeah. whatever, the normal blankness. Well, I was a music that publisher, was, so I get a million of that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, mm -hmm. and that was it. And that was my, um, that was it. That was my take on trying to, you know, make it out there as a, let me say, like a Billy Ocean or um, this guy, a Hathaway. You know, the guy who had the song, um, What is love? Baby, yeah, don't yeah, hurt yeah. me. Mm -hmm. He's from San Fernando, right? Or he, Maybe I he's sure. a Sando boy living from out in Sando. Europe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there are a couple yeah. of them. Uh, so can the whole world need the, 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 a couple yeah, of them songs yeah. was kind of yeah, big in you Europe. Had, eh? You um, had mad, you had mad stunt man too. I like to move it, move it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that, yeah that was big too. too. So a couple of these guys really made it, and and their song. I mean, some of them might be one hit wonders, but they make some millions off it. You know, that same. I like to move it, move it. Yeah, 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 yeah. That yeah, that was mm -hmm. in I was in movies and all kind of thing. Yeah, so in movies and right, yeah, 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 mm -hmm. and. So I tried to see if I could have been in that category, but I feel I feel we have to base ourselves up there and live that life. We have, you know, move across there from young, be like a Billy Ocean and 
and keep knocking. Orange Sky has that same problem too. My my boy is Orange Sky. Mm -hmm. They keep shopping the music from here, but every and it's the same problem. When they go there, it's always a kind of thing. Oh, go oh boy. My wife say I had to come back home. <laughs> um, I have a business to run. Yeah, it's the yeah, same yeah. thing. Nigel mm -hmm. and Nicholas Rojas, they are really good friends of mine. And they went on a 52-state American tour. They toured the whole of America with um, a very popular Swedish guitarist, Yingui Mamstein. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They were the opening act for Yingui mm -hmm. Mamstein. Yeah, I used and to do work for them too. I used to do work for them. I record. For Nigel? Yeah, I record. Yeah. Yeah. Nigel is my real partner. I'm a boy, you know. <laughs> yeah. Not one of the best songwriters ever come out of Trinidad. Great, yeah. song, great I'm songwriter. Yeah, and I'm too. What? Yeah, Nigel is a boss. Mm -hmm. And it's the, same, it's the same problem. They they don't want to live out there because they have commitments here. And yeah, that, time passing that, them by. That, that seemed to be the problem, you know. Wow. Yeah. But um, you know, but mm. but I mean living and living and making a livelihood is a very real thing, eh? You know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah, well, yeah, well and we and probably we are uh, we not hungry enough. So yeah. let me ask you, Michael, yeah. is the um Soka Elvis how does how doing the two, Soka Elvis and Chutney, how did that work out for you? Well Mario, I I glad. I mean, I don't have the Soka Elvis image. Any? Uh, uh. All right, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, well, no fright, no fright. Now we'll get you back. I'll get oh. you back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll go to. I'll go to. Right, right. right. Mm -hmm. Saying, yeah. I I don't look like I have the Soka Elvis image anymore. Right. But when I joined the Chutney Fraternity in 2007, I was accepted right away. Because if you really check, Elvis Presley's image and his um the way he dresses in, in the in the in the fancy um in the glitter suits costumes and all that and you compare it to what they do in Bollywood <laughs> it's very similar. You know, where they wear the capes and the, 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 the rhinestones and all that. When you watch the Bollywood movies with Shah Rukh Khan and them and they have all the, the fancy jackets and things. So what what happened with me was I was almost like um accepted immediately. Because the first time I hit the stage in a Chutney Soka Monarch, I had on a gold Elvis costume. And the experience I had from the Soka world, which was the um, like the spectacular and with Cyclop and being in Soka Monarch a couple of times. By the time I took that experience across, across there to the Chutney Soka stage, I was immediately embraced. I made the finals of the Chutney Soka Monarch. And I was touring right away. I started to go Guyana, New York. I didn't, again, I didn't have a, a radio hit in 2007, but they were playing my songs on the East Indian. I had, a, it was hits on the East Indian radio stations, which was like 106, 101.1, which was um, Win, Win, Win TV, Win Radio, um, 103.1 FM. At, in those days, there were like three major. East Indian stations that would play Chutney Soka music. And right away, I, I was embraced. And by it just kept getting bigger and bigger. Then I had the Drunkard song. And then I had the Rum Do Bother Me. And I kept the Elvis costume in, but I wasn't singing anything close to Elvis. Nothing was Elvis in the music anymore. The only thing that remained Elvis was yep. my image and my costume in. And they embraced it because it now became like a Bollywood a Bollywood kind of thing because I was using melodies from old Indian traditional Indian Bollywood film songs. So um, it kept growing and growing and growing. And then, uh, you know, and then with age, I mean, the younger guys started coming up like KI, you have the like KI and well, and Ravi B. Well, Ricky Jai, I would say, like Ricky Jai and myself, we are, we are the same kind of um, same kind of age bracket. But I mean, the young guys started coming up there, and and not even Ricky Jai in recent times could have won a Chutney Soka Monarch by then. Eh? So, if you really check it to to get back in that game, you had to have a big, a big, big hit. So, um, I'm still in it, but I have a whole different image. Soka, uh, fortunately and unfortunately, Soka Elvis name has stuck with me on the East Indian side of the fence, which is the Chutney Soka. 
Um, I try to go back a Zoom, but if I go back a Zoom, people don't know. People don't know who I am. I don't. I don't think people in the Chutney Soka industry care if I have a bald head and a beard anymore. They, they. I'm stuck. Soka Elvis now could 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 put on a wig and grow back his sideburns, or I could come out with a bald head and a, and a beard once. Once my performance is is top of the line, I have good costume in, and um, I have a radio hit. I don't think they care about me looking like Elvis anymore. I kind of got stuck with the name. I don't know. You, you understand what I say? Mm -hmm. So you're still interested in performing then, in in, in doing music? Yeah, 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 St yeah. Uh, I'm still performing. I'm gonna try. To, I'm, I'm recording a song every year. Next year. Next year, I have a plan to do a, a nice tribute to um, to Rasho T.I. I, I want to do a remake of um, Om Shanti Om. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I, I think that would that would be nice to kind of re, to, to relaunch my, my Soka Elvis career. You know when that song first came out by Shorty, the, um, the Hindu community make some noise and they had the song banned, eh? Yeah, they banned yeah, it. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah, but I don't think that relevant anymore i think you could do it now because i've heard yeah i've heard um yeah musicians from india doing it shorty's version and they accept it yeah. so yeah so yeah it should be a, but in them days they say that was our religious thing and you cannot be doing that in um in in yeah. in, in yeah. fat and you know but i think it's cool now yeah man so go ahead and do it man have you ever sung any um the mighty That's trini right. songs by the way was that sorry? I said, have you ever sung any of the Mighty Trini songs? I did it once. Um, mm -hmm. Leston Paul was managing a casino in Grand Bazaar Island Club Casino, and he had an independent show, and he hired myself and KB Charles and one or two other performers. I don't remember who it was, and he asked me to actually do a tribute to Mighty Trini, and I did curry, I did curry to Banka and um, and sailing. Yes, mm -hmm. and that was my. My one and only time, and I actually did a good job of it. Right. And mm. I keep telling Big Rich, one of my producers, that we should approach the Mighty Trini to do a, a remake of his song, Karita Banka, and I would like to be part of it, you know? Yeah, I think that, I think that yeah, could that, work. That, 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 could that work. should do well, eh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. If we do it in real I, chutney, that, real chutney. Thanks for giving me the encouragement. That's something I've been thinking about, too, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, you see, well, let me see. We be be running now for like an hour and 12 minutes mm -hmm. or so. And it's still have curfew and Mr. Mario have to make it back but up to the thing yeah. before. So, um, Mario, you go ahead and ask yeah, him. Yeah. To, um, before we... Well, recently you've been sending out some information as regards to the the situation artists face now with not being able to get work, travel abroad. So could you explain some of that for us? All right. Well... Recently, re before the first lockdown we had in March 2020, um, I was doing fairly well as an artist. I was working a lot at some of the casinos and then Movie Tong. I was getting a lot of jobs at Movie Tong in Fiesta Plaza, Movie Tong, San Fernando, also Movie Tong in Chaguanas, and then there was a the Hard Rock Cafe. So, I mean, I was working fairly regularly. I was doing, I mean, as I said, even though I, I, I might not have a big radio, radio hit in recent times, I was doing a lot of cover songs and I was doing fairly well. I even had a, a management position at one of the casinos where I was hiring entertainers on a weekly basis and I was being paid a fee for that. So with the closure of, of, of all those industries, you know, the bars, the clubs, the, the, the movie house, the movie theaters, the restaurants, um, our, my income has been hit very hard. And as the months go by, and I mean, it's turning into almost a year and a half now, I kind of realize like no no entertainers are coming out and, and speaking out about, you know, about them finding the authorities taking too long to to, to put something in place for us. They, they, um, it's always about the fast food outlets, the hardwares, the retail, the shopping malls. So, but when it comes to the entertainment sector, which is bars, casinos, restaurants, mm -hmm. um, movie theaters, where we we I think we've been treated. Um, we 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 the last 
we're the last on, on the scale of things to happen, you know. Well, and what else is what, so, so? What else is new? <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've been saying the borders open, we could travel abroad. So I ended up doing a one-man protest on Saturday. Well, I was joined by a good friend of mine, Bobby Mohan, and his son Nikolai Mohan from the W86, the workshop 868 band from in Diamond Village. Real, real nice guys. I was joined by them. They came. One of them played guitar. One of them did a Facebook Live. And I expressed to the, the media that it's not that easy to jump on a plane and go outside. To go out and perform at Miami Carnival, you had to have a, a work permit. And that's like $3,500 US. The embassy closed. So to get that, you had a pastoral lawyer. That must be an X500 US. So it doesn't make any sense trying to get work out there. So I, I think the government needs to... They have a lot of ideas that could be done to create... Um, work in the entertainment industry. There's something called a drive-in concert, which is like a kid on a kid on a cinema, kid on a drive-in cinema. So instead of going and see a movie, you drive into a parking lot, safely everybody distance in the cars, they stay in the cars and they watch they watch the entertainers perform and people serve them the drinks in the car and they have proper toilet facilities with proper cleaners and security to make sure the place is not crowded up and people not gathering in, in, in big groups and and um, spreading any kind of, you know, any kind of virus or anything. And that is one of the ideas. It, it kind of sounds crazy, but that is an idea that they actually do in, in, um, in Europe and in the States. Yeah, but... Or they had fully open back. Yeah, but there's a, pri um, there's a private sector um, issue, though. There's private sector had to throw that. Where's where? Where mean the government yeah, should no, no, but, yeah, but the it, government should facilitate should facilitate it, allow it to happen. That's what you're saying, right? Government, is, yeah, because they try to do it with with a driving cinema. I think South Park or somebody tried to do it, and they stop them right away. The authorities stop them. So if mm -hmm. they will stop a cinema type one, they, uh, obviously they will stop a live entertainment one. Um, mm -hmm. Well, they would they saying. they would say that they they had this thing for some grant for people in the entertainment industry and that kind of thing. Okay, but I think no. it was just a $5,000. That was $5,000. Yeah, yeah. That's making that in a, in yeah, a, in well. a weekend. And, and the, the more struggling ones will make will take a month to make that, which is like a salary for a month. And then if you multiply that by 18 months, that is over 100 and something thousand dollars in lost income for yeah, a yeah, man yeah, singing yeah, in a little yeah. casino and a bar two, three times for the month. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I haven't worked... <laughs> In months, I mean, you know, it gave me a little chance to do things like this, right? But yeah, um, but that's, I spoke about the producers too. I didn't just go to represent. Yeah, I know, um, you know, but frontline you know, singers. But I spoke about producers, musicians, musicians DJs. Yeah. My friend Nicholas Rojas has a studio called the Proden Studio. Oh, he, oh, he running Proden now. Proden, yeah, he bought over Proden from Pierre Delmas. It Proden and still in, It's still in Saint James. No, they moved to um, Gaston Johnson Street okay. in uh, Mokorapo, next mm -hmm. to Fatima. Mm -hmm. And he, they haven't been getting any work. When, when, when Pizza Hut and KFC and Royal Castle not doing any jingles, um, mm -hmm. the studios, the guys like yourself not, not getting any work to do. I mean, you could approach Ministry of Health and try to get a, a, a jingle done for them to, to promote wearing of the mask or be vaccinated. I know they have mm -hmm. options like that for you guys, but... I know it's hard. Nobody advertising right now. Yeah, you know? yeah. No, it, yeah, the yeah. Music, so, yeah. So what do you think is the next step? I, well, I honestly feel that you need to get a couple of artists behind you. Right. You know, and, and, well, and get them on board to really get yes. the government to recognize this thing, you know? And I yeah. really feel that, that more artists should have jumped and you jump on board and support you because I could understand the plight to everybody. You know what I mean? You're talking about thousands of people unemployed for 18 months <laughs> yeah and that, that's really hard mm -hmm. you know what i mean well I, I plan to i plan to hit i plan to do it at napa next and i feel with the with the response that i got the social media response and everybody that i have on my my group mm -hmm. um the artists were kind of hesitant at first and because of the response i got they saw i was on ttt i was on um tv6 Mm -hmm. I was um, in the Express mm -hmm. newspaper, and all of a sudden, everybody want to jump on board because well, yeah. the one-man protest get all the attention. So I said, you know what? Um, I will, em I will embrace them because um, 
I did invite them. I invited about over 100 and something artists and DJs and everybody. Hey, boy. Robin, like, wait. You know what, man? Tell me. A big artist call and say, Elvis, boy, I really want to come, boy, but I have some workmen coming to put, to fix them, um, to do a little, um, what do we call it? Not construction. Um, repairs. I have a little home repairs to do, boy. Yeah. I can't make it, boy, but I'll come for the next one. Our next man call and say, oh, go, boy. It's a football on TV, boy. I, I can't make that. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. and, yeah. So yeah. I ended up getting two really nice guys to show up. These guys, um, Bobby, Bobby Mohan and Nikolai Mohan, they're mm. music producers. They're full-time musicians. Mm. They showed up and they spoke really well. One of them backed me up with the guitar. And, you know, so, so yeah. I feel, Mario, I feel by the next one, even if I get three, four more people to join me, I, I think it will be a big improvement to the first one, you know? So I will do that. I will continue to do it. Um, and and, and look like the industry need need. Soon. It look like the industry needs some leaders. I mean, everybody's so quiet. I mean, it's shocking to yeah, see how everybody's so quiet and quiet. and not getting up. You know, yeah, look, my partner yeah. Robin taking it like so. What that is not no, new. No, no, no. You know, people need I, to get. It's the government is only listen to people when they make some noise. You know what I mean? Otherwise, nobody ain't gonna listen to you. You see, and another thing too, uh, a shitty thing with Trinidad too, is whenever, don't care how noble your um, your protest is, once you, it always it is always be seem to be political, like you're against the government or, or you know it it yeah, and and people just kind of break some that eh? because they say boy. That's, I, that's why I, that's why in my article with the, with Michael Mondesini Express I said. This is not political. This is analytical. Uh, right. This is not a protest. This is a plea. I made sure, and, and I use the word authorities. I didn't use the word government. I didn't call Rowley name. I didn't right. call Faris name. I didn't call UNC or PNM, and I made sure, and I'm keeping it that way. You know, so, um, because I know, I, I kind yeah, of yeah, yeah. people like that, you know. Scene. Yeah, yeah, afraid. yeah. I mean, you know, you, 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 when this, it have people I know who, they call a spade a spade. So when when this one in power and they say something, they see they brand them to be the other party. And then when the other party come in power and they say something, they brand them, uh, you know, uh, for the opposition, yeah. you know. So yeah, you know. So a... so um, what is the plans for the future? First of all, as regards to we don't know how long this pandemic will last. Um, and if you all don't do something. You know, it will just keep no income for artists. And I mean, you're living by this your whole life. And to be out yeah. of income yeah. is, is really tough because you can't do anything else. I mean, you could try, but all other businesses could be affected too at the same time because I know what you do. So, you know, normally I, I'm on your clients and I can't do anything similar. Yeah, yeah, look, at, yeah. You know, look at your business with, with yeah. outdoor activities and things. I, yeah. I, you know? I um I know how I know how that is so the boat well, it's two years now, eh? I mean it's second year. Mm -hmm. Has been shut down, you know. All right. So moving forward, where you think um the music and entertainment industry could go from here? Where you think we need to do? You mean um on a whole or, or on a whole, on a whole. What how you think what is the best way you think to move well, the industry I think forward? Things will open back. I, I think we will have a carnival. Mm -hmm. Um you see this eight hundred thousand. I'm I'm one of the people that I'm pro vaccine. I, I got my vaccine, eh? my Chinese vaccine, by the way. I get my Sinopharm. Mm -hmm. I'm not against it. I I was in two minds before I thought the whole um I thought this whole COVID thing was a hoax. Oh, well. Um, but I say, you know what, if, if I want to travel and go abroad and, and perform when things open back up and thing, I'm going to take the chance. And I, I got my two vaccinations and I would, um, encourage people to get it. I think within about by September, October, so things will, everything will, will open up, but again, they will leave the music industry for last. And we may... We may have a carnival, I, I think, maybe late February. I'm here in late February, into March, we might have a carnival. And um, in terms of the recording industry, I like what I'm hearing from the the young the young fellas, boy, um, Robin. They have, I mean, like, you like Pretty and Putinsky and Merch. What's Merchant's son name? Um, um, uh, tall guy, oh, go on. Tall guy, yeah. Um, second star, yeah. second star. 
second star. Yeah, that is and, good. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. That music uh, good. That is good music. Music, you know? I love. I love. The, I'm not criticizing them. Fellas making some nice music. And yes. you think the, you think the yes. music, it, it, um, the production of the music, good enough for the globe, right? Yeah. Right. So, the so, so then it's just exposure now. Then marketing and that kind of thing. That is the problem. Yeah, I, I think we still. All of us in the stuck in the same um, vein of being in the same West Indian diaspora. It's like it's still even though the music changing and this they used to call for the slowing down of the music and the soca was mm -hmm. too fast. They said that is where that is where dancehall and reggae was beating us back because it was a more groovy music. Right. You know, if you hear if you hear bump and wine in the conga line in a in a club in in South Florida, people would treat it and dance like it's a, a limbo festival. Right, but yeah, yeah, hear, yeah, yeah, novelty. When you hear um, a Gregory Isaac night nurse, a man go grab a woman and start a groove. That, that is the talk out there in America. They say you can more groove is a more love music, reggae music, right? Right. And they think that's why it has made it more than soca music because it's more festival. But guys like Voice and, and, and Kess and these guys, they're slowing, and, and Marshall to extent, they're slowing it down and they, they're having it a little more groovy now. Right. Um, so I I don't know I I don't know what to say I thinking I think in something maybe it's marketing maybe all right it, 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 you think the, the you think the in, you think the in, not doing right you think the internet um kind of level the playing field we you feel we could use the internet to get out there I think we need to do a little more um. I think we need to do a little more because how, from time to time, I go on the internet and I look at views of the international artists like The Weeknd and Dua Lipa and, uh, and Post Malone and, and these people, the kind of views they have because they, it, boils down to, it boils down to being on the billboard charts. The same thing, General Grant and, and KMC. I think it was, yeah, General Grant was the original one that was saying we need to take soca music right to the billboard charts because... If you're not on that top 40 or on that Rick D's Kong Dong, you're not going to get that 225 million views or, or or billion views that Post Malone and, 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 and Taylor Swift and them get in. So it still boils down to we need a category for it. Um, And I thought there was. I thought there was a category for so Connie Billboard. I, I don't know what happened to that. Oh, sorry, in the Grammys. They said we had a, we had a category one year where Soka was part of the... the the, um, mm -hmm. the Grammy Awards and I never hear nothing about it again. Yeah, I didn't see I must, anything I about it. I must find out year, about that. You know? Yeah, Gil Figaro and them guys had was for years was trying to get it in as yeah. a as a category. Yeah. You know, but I think in Billboard we go under world music and that kind of thing. Now. World music, yeah. Yeah, you know. Yeah. If boy we could talk about this <laughs> all night long because if you really check it recently, Ed Sheeran and Justin Bieber had a hit where they did like a remake of, of, of a reggaeton and it sung exactly like a soca beat. Yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I forget it. You know the song I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Ed Sheeran and Justin Bieber. That was one of the most viewed songs on the um on the on YouTube and it was a soca beat. They was calling it a reggaeton, but it was like a soca beat. And so people saying, well, if them could do it with a soca beat, a reggaeton, why, uh, take that same soca beat. You reggaeton know? is soca. I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, okay, cool. It was very nice. Mario, you have anything else for Mr. Zoom? Well, <clears throat> let's see. Okay, well, first of all, yeah, um, I have to applaud you for being able to survive 30 years in the music. Um, Thanks, Mario. And, and, well, being able to be versatile, I mean, Chutney here, Soka Elvis there, and still survive without having that um, personality, as they say. You know, having a varied yeah. personality, you know, that, that is important. So if it works, I mean, keep it up, you know what I mean? You don't have to try and change and go to a fancy producer to produce something and, you know, keep going at the way you're going and, and, and make it as you're going. Um, so I, we look forward to the, even the stuff like, um, as you say, the chutney with um, character banker in chutney, real chutney rather than calypso. You know, right, I right. mean, you could, um, Big Rich could put out some real tassa with that and 
make it song yeah yeah you know focus yeah. on the music and the tasa yeah. you know a lot of productions and remixes they try to do the same thing what the original artists do and it wouldn't have that feel and appeal so you got to do something you could use the same melody and the same song and the same singing but your music got to be totally you know different you know it got to be um energetic people got to want to dance t- with the music without even you singing you know and yeah, um yeah. that you know that is the first thing i would see if you have to do a remix a karita banco rather than um, yeah. just try and be like trini and you know you had to come out with them tasa and them drums and heavy yeah. and and yeah. create our feel and then you just come in and you know benefit from that i feel you know but anyway keep up the good work um you know and and keep up the thing i i hope things could work out for the artists i hope more artists will come and join you i also yes. have to applaud you for the first person to really stand up and try and make a difference you know and um we as a people need people to do that you know because we ourselves a bit afraid to get out there so we yeah. need people to yeah. lead the industry so it you don't have to be a big top singer to do it you just have to be somebody around and and you have chose to do it so i wish you success in it and and maybe bring blessing to the whole industry right thanks a lot mario thanks for yeah. the support man yeah man yeah. thanks for having me robin man yeah man oh what Yes, yeah. Trinidad and Tobago. Zoom, Soka Elvis. You know, so glad to have him here, you know. And, um, you know, this was a good episode. Um, so look forward for next week when we come in with another episode of Moving Forward. All right. So bye for now. Right. One love. One love.